I'm not going to lie to you, I'm in a bit of a creative rut at the moment. I've been trying and largely failing to put together an opus of the Magnum variety, but I can't, and I think I know why. I think we're all to some extent grateful for the content distribution algorithms that ingest, filter, rank, and distribute media. Together, that media makes up our perception of the world. An awesome task. I'll admit it, having to sift through the internet to find the material I want to see, uh, it, it sounds awful. I wouldn't even know where to begin. So I have to give the algorithms that I've outsourced this cognitive load to their flowers. They make consumption convenient. I can be pushed personalized information passively instead of actively pulling information. But when I stop, reflect, breathe, and ask myself what I remember from the bottomless feed, it's only the format of a select video or two. I remember the trends and headlines with all the detail stripped away. I don't really remember the last video I watched. The information that passively washed over me sits in my brain as background static, but the time is gone all the same. And it may sound weird for me to say that that specific convenience that I just praised is a trap, but, uh, well, the thing is, To break out of my rut, I need to leave my enclosure. Go to parks, museums, libraries, coffee shops, anywhere will do. I find inspiration from the stuff and interactions here. Cynically, that makes me a better writer, sure. My goal in writing anything isn't some numeric abstraction of goodness. It's more poetic and unquantifiable. So out here, the misalignment in motives and power imbalances that exist in my contentious relationship with platforms become clear. To state the obvious, convenience is good for business. The platforms have a foundational financial interest in making content relevant and personalized for you. The high-level economics go something like this. The longer the platform's walled garden keeps you scrolling via personalized targeting, the more the platform can demand of advertisers. The more users visit the site consistently, the more ads are served, and the more money made. In industry nomenclature, time on platform or time on site and monthly active users are really North Star metrics to see how much a platform can demand from advertisers. The revenue per user is captured by the metric average revenue per user, and that is how much our attention is worth to the platforms at least. And it makes sense, right? No one is staying on an app with content that is irrelevant or inaccessible. If I just got putrid AI-generated cooking videos that have no real conception of human food over and over again, instead of my beloved, my betrothed slime scooping videos, I'm going to uninstall and do my version of a factory reset. Enter the algorithm a sequence of quantitatively rigorous step-by-step -step instructions to solve a specific problem. In this instance, a well-functioning algorithm should serve personalized content to the right people at the right time in order to maximize retention or time on site. At scale, this becomes the primary driver of what media gets placed before our eyeballs. How the algorithm makes the determination relies on a basket of metrics, together called engagement. Likes, sure, comments, sure, subs, Yes, so view duration, absolutely. 30 second retention, undeniably. Consecutive videos watched, indubitably. All quantifiable measures that may sort of kind of be proxies for media quality, but serve a profit motive first and foremost. You may be eager to point out that my list of metrics is not comprehensive. Hell, I'm not even sure if they're all correct because the algorithms are black boxes or opaque mechanisms. You may see what goes in and you may see what comes out, but you do not see how the distribution actually occurs. Why am I seeing this slime video in particular? Who knows? Therefore, I can't pin down their precise machinations, only the inferred incentives at the start and the observed outcomes at the end. Platforms have a motivation to keep it this way. Pesky nerds like me can't find out precisely what makes them tick and attempt to game the algorithm so I can flood it with my nerd this might result in a bad experience for other users. But also the secret formula may be considered a competitive advantage, trade secret, or moat. Basically, the platform may not want other platforms copying it. And I want you to make me a Krabby Patty! 
response. Why don't you ask me later? Given our overview of platform financial motives, it's easy to see why the feeds never end. There's always a next thing in the scroll at little marginal cost outside of your time. More convenient dopamine hits for the consumer, another ad for the platform, while the promise of high reach, high distribution if the black box deems a piece of media worthy creates the alluring opportunity of life-changing virality for a creator if they continue to play the viral lottery. That viral potential itself resulting in a rush of adrenaline and dopamine. Chasing that next dopamine hit or that next adrenaline hit and staving off the sudden withdrawal, the withdrawal of the hooks, is kind of starting to look like an addiction cycle, but that's beyond my pay grade. This all has side effects. The most obvious side effect in my view is doom scrolling, or impulsively consuming negative content. Doom scrolling is a product of mechanics and incentives that algorithms have created, serving increasingly fatalistic distillations on a topic to a user as they exhibit information-seeking behavior characteristic of anxiety. The audience, having appeared, encourages further creation of doomer content by creators, creating a downward spiral, a lucrative trap of the cognitive variety. Stepping away from the digital world and into the analog, I think like as a person making doomer content and wallowing in doomerism, allowing in the paralysis that comes with that is very easy. While the simple act of moving forward, advocating or acting requires tremendous effort, it's convenient to wallow in doomerism. I bring up doom scrolling in particular because it's illustrative of how distribution algorithms replete with their financial incentives, opaque systems, emergent bias against new ones, and corporate overlords, really dictate the contents of the content. Was it always this way? When Unk joined Facebook.com in the late aughts, early 2010s as a pre-tween, were the financial incentives laid so bare, so obvious? Was it my youth-addled mind that was so naive to miss it then? Unequivocally, no. The platforms that I signed up for and the platforms that are, are simply not the same. The social network in Aaron Sorkin's The Social Network is the same social network today in name only. Platforms will morph in ways that appear subtle but are pervasive, a process Cory Doctorow calls inshittification. This term was so resonant when it was coined in 2022 that it has won accolades. The high-level economics of inshittification go something like this. Content platforms initially offer huge value to users, what we can call consumer surplus, a free way to connect with their social graphs. As the number of users grow, network effects and FOMO attract even more users and create lock-in. With a critical mass of highly engaged users, platforms then approach advertisers. High engagement and better ad targeting provide huge value to the advertiser. This degrades the user experience, what we can call supplier or advertiser surplus. The platforms eventually hold audience and advertiser hostage from one another and extract rent for access, degrading the experience for both consumer and advertiser. In the process, new upstarts can be bought out, resulting in very few players who control the content distribution game, an awesome power over media, culture, and public perceptions. After all, Every time TikTok shows you a video you ask to see, it loses a chance to show you a video it wants you to see. An added wrinkle is that you probably won't even notice. What you might have discovered is hard to notice when you're just seeing the black box's output with few alternatives. But I think there's something deeper there. The inshittification changes with it, the shape of communities. Community isn't really good for quantifiable business goals. Social networks IRL are dynamic and messy and overlapping, and that's, like, that's no good, right? For every minute I spend outside my enclosure rejecting the doom scroll the black boxes serve me, that's a minute I'm not well doom scrolling with ads interspersed. This isn't confined to social media algorithms, by the way. Every time you ask a friend for a ride to the airport or crash at their place, that's a dollar Uber and Airbnb aren't getting. I would basically argue that community and capitalism kind of live in a constant tension. Luma AI is an AI video generation company. There's this quote by the CEO Amit Jain that I just can't stop thinking about. Today, videos are made for 100 million people at a time. They have to hit the lowest common denominator. A video made just for you or me is better than one made for two unrelated people. Respectfully, this is so uncritical, it misses the mark on what makes a great piece of media by such a wide margin 
that it actually boomerangs back around to being insightful. At its core, it's self-serving to say that content with emotional honesty and depth of narrative that transcends the self, achievable by the creative ingenuity of artists, is worthless. Instead, we should make a hyper-personalized world. A world with perfect personalization is a more fragmented world, with fewer common experiences and values that make up a community. And seeing friends from my social graph whose lives have drifted further from mine naturally over time isn't going to keep me retained. So platforms kind of need to go from one, a more egalitarian social network of friends and peers. The thing that brings people on board in the first place. This is the social network that the movie The Social Network is talking about, to a hierarchical and hyper-competitive parasocial network of audience and creator. Connections are conveniently forged but weak, without the effort of investing in the community or the risk of disappointment that comes with active discovery. This might be, hopefully, what the social network part two will be about. There's only the feeling of a mutual connection, when in reality there's only the one-sided relationship with the algorithm. Just like I feel like I'm discovering new content all the time through algorithmic osmosis, but I can't recall what I discovered. When I think about what would constitute an opus of the magnum variety, I find that I can't really extricate it from the numeric signifiers of success on YouTube and other platforms, especially if the prevailing attitude is there is no great work unless the greatness is captured numerically, even if the quantification mechanisms are flawed. The incentives point to making something kind of surreal. How did you even figure out that posting a hundred times a day Facebook, works? Facebook told us. They said it doesn't matter. You can post like 10 pieces of content every hour. It doesn't matter. You know how many impressions we get every month? 9.2 billion views in the last 30 days. 120,000 posts in its lifetime. 31.5 million followers. This woman announced on Reddit she's trying it. One day 100 posts challenge min-maxing for engagement, like Mr. Beast, is highly lucrative. Not a knock, by the way. Like, I'm genuinely impressed at the effort it takes to get this good, to achieve this level of algorithmic mastery. But it results in content for everybody, but also content for nobody at the same time. Or it's content for everybody, but mostly just content made for the algorithm. In a system that responds increasingly to itself, serving content with high potential for engagement, then taking the feedback to make further recommendations in a circular feedback loop, I question the role of those numeric signifiers and what they actually stand for, how they influence our taste, signify belonging to an in-group saying reassuringly that you're not alone in liking what you've seen, and of course creating a convenient reward system for creating things. I'm not the first person to question the role of numbers in social media, by the way. The Twitter interface is filled with numbers. These numbers, or metrics, measure and present our social value and activity online, enumerating followers, likes, retweets, and more. But what are the effects of these numbers on who we follow, what we post, or how we feel when we use the site? Inviting us to consider these questions through our own experience, Twitter Demetricator is a web browser extension that hides the metrics. Follower, like, and notification counts disappear. Through changes like these, Demetricator lets us try out Twitter without the numbers, to see what happens when we can no longer judge ourselves and others in metric terms. With this work, I aim to disrupt our obsession with social media metrics, to reveal how they guide our behavior, and to ask who most benefits from a system that quantifies our public interactions online. Unfortunately, API changes and totally related name changes have rendered the app inoperable. I mean, fundamentally, I want two things that are constantly drifting apart. A more poetic, intrinsic growth, one that resists the quantification and the numeric trappings of algorithmic success. I want to make something that you remember, but also something that you kind of vibe and engage with. Passive consumption does have its place, after all, but I find that it quickly becomes the dominant form. In making this video, I went to a local cafe a bunch to write, and I found out that the manager there, Marika, makes some truly excellent music. And though we're mutuals on social platforms, not once had any of her content surfaced to me. Maybe they were under all of the suggested reels and ads. But having found it through discovery outside of the platforms exclusively, 
I remembered it, so much so that I licensed it for this video. And none of that would have been possible without engagement of a different variety, an engagement that I'll remember. And that's the type of engagement that I want to prioritize. Because convenience is a trap. This stuff really works? Certainly does. Oh, well, lots of luck! Oh!